I, uh, I decided to allow my, uh, my consigliere to stay with me yeah, as, we, uh, as we interviewed uh, the, the next guest here. He is one of the biggest, was, was one of the biggest mob money earners. Excuse me one minute. <laughs> okay. He, he, he didn't say move yet. Oh, oh okay. Wait till I give you the heads up. Okay. Okay. It's, he's one of the big mob earners since Al Capone. Relax. And one of the youngest, in, the youngest individual in Fortune magazine listed as the 50 biggest mafia bosses. He's number 18. Wow. Oh. Wow. Come on. Give it oh. up. Well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> in the old days. But back in the old days. And, uh, you know, a lot of times if, you, if you're watching like A&E or something like that, you see one of those, you know, mob bios. You're going you're gonna to see his name pop up. One of the few guys who was able to live that life, to rise to, the, to be a captain in the Colombo crime family and make it out alive, not only make it out alive, but make it out alive, born again, saved, and in the ministry. Uh, he had a, what they call a Damascus Road experience. He's going to talk about that here today. He's, he's a motivator for the, for the youth and he's a professional and uh, student athletes and he speaks to corporate executives. He wrote books like, um, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> Surprise. <Thank you. laughs> The Good, the Bad, and the Forgiven, Blood Covenant, which is being made into a movie about his life. Would you please welcome, save, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, but still 100% Italian, Michael Frangese. Thank you, brother. Thank you. So, uh, how you doing? I'm doing good, but honestly, I got a little nervous. The last time I was sitting with two other Italians, I was under arrest. So I don't know. But uh, this is like a RICO indictment here, three of us. It's Jimmy, Carmen, and Michael. I know. If Frankie and Carmen were here, we'd sure be under arrest. But, we're definitely. Uh, we're going to get in trouble. So uh, this is the Michael Frenzy. What do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm, I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> I can't hear. I'm deaf. I don't know nothing. All right, you didn't see, you didn't know nothing. You don't see nothing. You came from the neighborhood. He knows. We used to live right near each other. So you guys are both from New York, right? Yes. No, Alabama. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just asking. This. I'm doing the interview. I'm asking questions. Oh you yeah, answer. I'm sorry. I'm not saying. Yeah. And your testimony today is you're from New York. From New York, okay. uh, Queens. So, um, when, when, just to give us a, a, a brief pers a perspective, when w were you as the active? Captain in the Columbos. I was. Uh, I came into the life. Actually, took the oath on uh, Halloween night, 1975. You come into the life. You come in as a soldier. And in uh, 1980, the boss of my family appointed me as a, a capo de regime or captain. And from 1980 until about 93, when I consider myself formally removed from that life, I operated as a captain. So for 13 years. Yes. That's a pretty long run, wouldn't you say? It was a good run at that time. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, a long run. <laughs> it was uh, the good old bad days, I right. call them. But uh, yeah, it, it was a long run. I mean, this may, I, I don't want to scroll ahead, but how many other guys do you know of who have actually made it out of that level of the mob um, alive? Just not, not even talking about getting being saved, but just alive and out there somewhere. Common, I, I honestly... Um, I don't know of anyone that's been able to reach the level that I've reached, not enter a witness protection program, and then publicly come out of the life. And, um, you know, I realized at some point in time that the only, I'm probably the most fortunate, most blessed guy that you're ever want to, gonna, gonna see in your life, because if I was lifted up to my own to do what I wanted to do, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. Just about every one of my associates have met that fate, but. I realized at some point in time, God had a different plan and a purpose for my life. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, look, I, I don't attribute anything, you know, my success or my, my uh, ability to get out of that life or anything that I did. Um, if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus, uh, I wouldn't be here, plain and simple. And, well, you know, being, being from being an Italian, I mean, we grew up with this all around us this is from New Jersey guys are from New York. You know, this is just part of our culture. And so, you know, the TV comes on, you're watching A&E, you're watching all these mob bios. Every single one of these mob bios ends with a guy either in prison 
are dead. I mean, that's just the end of the story. Your story is completely unusual in the fact that you actually went to prison for, you were prison for how long? I did, uh, I got a 10 year sentence. I did eight years on the 10. And, um, but when you went in, you didn't like confess anybody else's sins. You just confessed your own. Yeah, no, I never, uh, it wasn't, uh, I didn't have anything against any of the guys in that life. I, I didn't want to hurt anybody. I just wanted out of the life. I met a young girl from Anaheim, California, actually, and uh, I fell very much in love with her. She was a young Christian and uh, also met her mother, who was a, uh, probably the, the most godly woman I ever met in my life, Carmen. Very simple woman, but powerful woman, woman of prayer. And uh, even today, um, my home church, uh, Agape House of Prayer in Anaheim, was started it's by your brother-in-law, right? my brother-in-law's church. Brother-in-law's I think he's church. in the audience, but um, yeah, he's, he's up here someplace. But uh, uh, my mother only, he started that church several years ago. And, um, you know, this woman, I believe, prayed me to where I am today. And, uh, yeah. Really. So, so when you, so when you, what, what? Got you. I, how'd you get caught? I get. I don't know. Caught, arrested. What did you? Well, what no. What I, I had. Uh, I went to trial actually five times. My dad was the uh, underboss of the Colombo crime family. My dad, at the age of ninety-four, has spent thirty-four years in prison. He's back in prison now. He's been in and out five times on parole violations. He was the underboss of that family, and uh, so he had a lot of publicity. That kind of came on me later on. I became a major target. I got indicted five times. I went to trial five times. I beat every case. I beat Rudy Giuliani in, in 84. He indicted me on a big racketeering case when he was the U.S. attorney. But when I met this young girl, um, she was a young Christian, fell very much in love. And I realized that my life was a direct contradiction to everything this woman and her mom believed. And if I was going to be with her, I had to make a break. And this is the amazing thing, Karma. When I met her, I'm at the top of my game beat every case, captain in a family. They were grooming me to be the boss. And I'm going mob all the way. I meet this young woman, and for some reason, my love for her becomes more powerful than this bond I had with my dad all my life, more powerful than this blood oath that I took. And I didn't understand it back then. I was just in love with a beautiful woman. But she was a godly woman. And I believe God put this woman in my life and saved my life through her uh, and gave me a different plan and purpose. And so I realized that I had to make a break. I took a plea. They were going to indict me again on another big case. Ten-year prison sentence, $15 million restitution. I married this young girl who, at the age of 21, I said, Honey, can you handle me doing a couple of years in prison? And my wife is Mexican. I'm Italian from Brooklyn. She's a Me- <laughs> My wife's Mexican. We're back, we're back to the Mexicans again. No, I got to tell you. are right. right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got to tell you how out of left field God. I never met a Mexican before. I never even ate a burrito before I met my <laughs> wife, right? I'm the first Mexican I met. I love Mexicans now, I'll be honest with you. I love the whole family. But, uh, you know, God put this woman in my life. I'm so attracted to her. And it wasn't because of God. I mean, God was important to her. To me, I just respected her beliefs. But I said, I got to make a break. So I take a plea. The government wanted to get a conviction on me. Ten-year sentence, $15 million restitution. I marry her. And I say to her, Camille, can you handle me doing a couple of years in prison? At the age of 21, she tells me, God will be in the foundation of our marriage. I'd rather have you in prison than with all these struggles on the street. And I always say that the story really is about her. It's not about me. I mean, I brought all this baggage on myself. But her conviction was so strong. And I was so impressed with her love of the Lord and my mother-in-law's love of the Lord that it just, you know, eventually caught me over a period of time. I mean, I didn't fall right away. It took God. I was a rough case. God had to do his work with me. I wasn't easy. But um, uh, so I took the plea, married this girl, and eventually the Lord uh, just won my heart over. And um, so when when you went in prison, though. How long were you in for? I mean, you said you said to her a couple of years, but it was longer than a couple of years. Well, I went in. I did five years and made parole. I come out of parole. When I had rejected the life, I never realized uh, it was going to become so public. I tried to do it quietly, but it hit Life magazine, all the papers in New York. My dad disowns me because he believes that maybe I'm going to start cooperating. The boss of my family, Carmi Persico, who's now doing life, immediate contract on my life. The feds come to me, Mike, your own dad approved the contract. You're in trouble. This will put you in a witness protection program, help us out. I don't want any of that. So I rejected it. I get out on parole. The 13 months I'm on on parole, the worst time of my life. 
I'm dodging bullets, literally. I'm trying to stay away from the feds. They're pressuring me. So they're me. trying to kill you? Oh, yeah. I mean, my wife and I, we couldn't put a house in our name, no utilities. I'm jumping from so one place to the other. So do they, like, not other. know where you're at? I mean, we're talking about the mobs trying to kill you. Well, it was a little different back then. You know, it's one thing, and, and I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but I'm, I'm just being honest with you. You know, you're in that life. You're in trouble. Your best friend puts his arm around you, walks you into a room. You don't right. walk out again. So, I mean, I had a lot of experience in the life, and I said, well, you know what? I've been there for a long time. They're going to have to get me. They're going to have to work at it because I understand this life as well as anybody. So I did what I had to do to try to stay away, I moved out to California, and kind of, you know, changed my whole lifestyle so that they couldn't create a pattern on me. Feds came to me several times. Mike, we got word from whether they like you or not. If they know your life is in danger, they're obligated to tell you. Mike, we got word from our informants, your life's in trouble, you got to move. My wife pick up, we move, we leave town. And, uh, and the whole time, God is working on me. God is working on me. And, you know, and I, uh, I accepted Christ, but I wasn't ready to surrender to Christ because I couldn't, I couldn't process surrendering. You know, I'm a mob guy. I'm in control of my life. You know, God helps those who help themselves. But I found out later on that, that our acceptance of the Lord is made whole in our surrender so that God can work through us. And, uh, so let me ask you, during this time, how, how did you make a living? You know what, Carmen, I, I'll be honest with you. It, it was so tough. I mean, big mob guy on the street made all this money. I was like a fish out of water in L.A. And, you know, it was very, very difficult for me to, to really get off again. And, uh, you know, I had a $15 million restitution, so I gave the feds a lot in order to get a 10-year deal. Long story short, they violate my parole. They had enough with me. I didn't want to cooperate. They violate my parole, clean me out financially, throw me in a hole in L.A., going to indict me on another racketeering case, violated me my parole. That night, they put me in a jail cell. They, uh, they said, you're done. My wife's home. She's 27 years old. We got two kids. I'm saying, how's this girl going to wait for me now? I may be in jail for the rest of my life. The girl I did all of this for, I'm going to lose. You know, they can't put me out on the yard. I got death threats all over me. I'm in that six by eight cell and a common worst night of my life. And I have never cried out to the Lord before. But that night I said to him, Lord, if you're up there, you need to give me something to help me feel better. I can't deal with this. I'm being honest. A prison guard walked by my cell. He says, Francis, you OK? You don't look good. I chased him. I said, get away from me. Don't bother me. I was mad. He comes back a minute later and he pushes a Bible through the slot on the door. I picked the Bible up. I'll be honest with you. Amen. I'm so angry with God. I take that Bible, toss it against the wall as hard as I could. I said, you know what? I got nothing but enemies. Only me and God in this cell. I don't need another enemy, right? I picked the Bible up. I said, God, help me out. I had never read the book of Proverbs before, ever. I opened the book, and for some reason, the first verse that really touches my heart, Proverbs 16:7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. And I believe in that verse, the Lord convicted me and gave me hope in the same verse because he said, yeah, you married this girl. Yeah, you left the life. But who'd you do it for? You didn't do it for me. You did it for you. And uh, it really got me. And then even your enemies are at peace with you. I had nothing but enemies that night. I started to read on a little bit more. I came to the verse that became the verse of my life, and I believe should be the verse of everybody's life. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Amen. I can tell you this. From that point, that night, I said, okay, God. I said... But I got to tell you this, Lord, I made a mistake in trusting my dad. I took a blood oath, entered that life. I said, two strikes. Look where it got me. I said, Lord, if you really are God, if this Bible is truly the blueprint for my life and Jesus is my risen Savior, you need to prove it to me. And the reason I say that, you know, I always say God gives us, he put us in this world and he gave us a lot of choices. And I don't think it's a bad thing to challenge God and say, God, show me the evidence. You know, I need to know. You put me in this world. You gave me a free will. I want to know. I want to believe. But show me. Well, I got to tell you, I know a little bit about evidence. All right. Five <laughs> trials. I mean, and believe me, I know our system inside out and upside out. When I started to really search, open this stubborn mind in my heart and said, God, show me. 
I found out, not beyond a reasonable doubt, which is our standard of proof in the criminal justice system, by any, by, beyond any doubt, the Bible is God's word and Jesus is our risen Savior. And he sold me in that cell. I spent three years in the hole, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, me and God. If you see my prison Bible, there's more of my notes on there than there is scripture. I must have read it a thousand times. I read over 400 books, with, uh, starting with Chuck Colson's Born Again. I had a Sony Walkman. I'd listen to Pastor Greg Laurie every day. I love Pastor Greg, that, you know, that soothing voice. So they would give you out tapes to listen to? No, not, I had a Sony Walkman oh. at the time, so oh, I so listened to the radio. Okay. Yeah, him and, you know, whoever else you want to listen to. <laughs> I wish you would, Ed, Jimmy. I could listen to you. But anyway... <laughs> And I came out, and I, you know, I had no choice. I surrendered. But you know what? I found out even when you don't want God, he wants you. Mm. Yeah. And he wouldn't let me go. And, uh, you know, you said something that I, you've said it a couple times, and it kind of went by. And I always meant to ask you this, is there was a time when you said Carmine Persico, who was, you know, he's just, he's one of the big top dogs if, <laughs> on A&E or, or any of these mob shows. I mean, he's like one of the big guys. Um, he... he Put, put, a, put a price out on you. So oh, yeah. time, time for you to go. Did he have to get an approval from your, from your dad to do that? Or does, did, you, did he just have to go along with it? No, what, he was a boss. So, you know, in that life, really, they, they talk about only the boss can put a contract on right. you. My dad at that time was a captain. My dad had to go along with it because if you bring somebody into the life and that person goes bad, well, you're in trouble for bringing them in. My you dad die. proposed me. So my dad was in a position where he really had to go along. And I, my dad loves me. And, and by the way, my dad and I didn't speak for 10 years, Carmen. I thought I'd never have a relationship with him again. Now we're closer than ever. God has brought that relationship full circle. So, I'm trying to figure out how, what, what, what was the, the pinnacle, the most difficult time of that, that family dynamic. So, obviously, the... the Persico says to your father, I, we got to do this. Go. If he... If he if he if he says no, he could be gone. Oh yeah, that he, night he had to go along. So, is does he s send word to you? Does he s sneak a message somehow, or does he just have to be quiet? How does that work? Well, you know, I knew yeah. I knew I was in trouble. There was no doubt. It, I knew the life well enough to know that I was in trouble, would, and I had to. Uh, to would do they my use? Best. Could they use your father to get to you? Well, I, I don't believe my dad would have went that far, yeah. and I don't think they would have put that pressure on him. But he had to go along with it. In other words, he, if, if, he, if he tried to argue it, there would have been a war in the family. I mean, it's, you know, those things are real. So at that point, did you feel like there was this separation between you and your dad because he was in the life or because you felt like he betrayed you? You know, I don't, I don't believe he betrayed me right. because I understood the life. And, you know, my wife has a difficult time with this. Well, right. you know, Mike, your dad, and how could he have done that? And I said, honey, you don't understand the life, but my father loves me. But we were such a product of that life right. that it, it takes over your it's whole mind. It's like a mind, military sort of a thing. Exactly. Right. But now, you know, like I said, we're closer than ever. And only Jesus could have restored that. And by the way, I, I want to tell you this. I've been praying for my dad for 15 years. I've had thousands of people praying him wherever I go and speak at a church. I figured if my father came to the Lord, it was going to be a deathbed experience. I never figured he would do it. But I had faith that the Lord would answer our prayers. Two months ago in a jail cell... In Manhattan, my dad accepted Christ. Wow. Sonny. 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 At the age of 94. Woo. So don't ever give up on prayer. People you love, don't ever give up on prayer. God answers prayer. You need prayer. to look online and see Sonny Francis. I mean, that, that's a serious mob guy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my dad is the oldest living mob guy in the country. Wow. He's, been, uh, he's been in that life 65 years. The oldest living guy. So, wow. But, uh, you know... One of the messages that I like to put, I work a lot with young kids, a lot of gangbangers. I really try to get them the right way, and I try to explain to these young people, why was I able to make it in this life? A good church, a Gopi house of prayer. These people reach out to anybody. The church welcomes everybody. My brother-in-laws, my mother-in-law, great people, right? you got to surround yourself with God-loving people. we got to be nourished all the time. I tell these young people, you are who you hang with. You hang with the wrong crowd, you could have a good heart, good mind, great family, you're going to be known as the wrong person. You have to surround yourself with God-loving people, and that's how you, you stay on track. And, you know, I tell people, you don't get a lobotomy when you come to Christ. You still remember the old way. Am I right, Jimmy? Yeah, you know, yeah. hey, we come to the neighborhood, you know. Hey. <laughs> you dropped me off from Brooklyn, I got the same accent, I'm ready to do the whole thing, right? But you got to stay around the right people, and you got to be nourished with the Lord all the time. And that's, that's how you succeed.
Now, seeing that it's your brother-in-law, I'm thinking that if it's your brother-in-law and it's, it's your church, obviously you're going to have to speak there every once in a while. I mean, you got to you got to come through with something. Whenever right? I'm not on the road, I'm at that church speaking. Right, so My brother-in-law need, is terrific. Y'all need to me. check check him out online. Agape, Agape House of Prayer. Agape House of Prayer, right. Lincoln uh, Lincoln Boulevard, Anaheim. Great church, open to everybody, and I love them. They've uh, so many people have have walked through those doors and never walked out again, but love the Lord. Well, you know. You've seen a lot of people walk through doors and never walk out again, right? Well, I didn't mean it that way. No, we, you know what? Didn't we grow up in one of those... We grew up near each other. We grew up in one of those neighborhoods, and no matter how you got killed, it was always a heart attack, right? <laughs> you could right. throw a guy off a 30-story building, and the cops go, what happened? But I don't know. It looked like a heart attack. It's a heart attack. Yeah. Something he ate. <laughs> <laughs> a guy with an ice pick in his back. Something what happened? I don't know. It looked like a heart attack. <laughs> Yeah, the guy grabbed his chest and fell on it 17 times. I didn't I see nothing. I didn't see nothing. I didn't see nothing. I didn't see nothing. What happened? I don't know. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> I was Forget looking the other it. way. I was watching TV. I was like, my Sony Walkman on. What do I know? I went to awake. I look in the coffin. It was just a hand in there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? Yeah, it looks good. Lost a few pounds, huh? <laughs> so the widow, she's crying. Oh, my husband, my husband. I said, what happened? Heart attack. <laughs> oh, damn. The best thing, Jimmy, you know, in that life, every weekend is weddings and funerals. <laughs> and every funeral, oh, doesn't he look so good? I don't know. He looked better when he was alive, but it's all right. <laughs> That's true. It's like that, that yeah. you're evaluated by how good you look when you die. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, we were putting, you know, what's funny with us, they were putting makeup on us, and we looked at each other like, the only people in our family get makeup is the it's corpses. When you're in <laughs> They're not here no more. No. <laughs> he's gone. No, he's yeah, gone. Heart attack. Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> So you, you got a movie that you're working on about yes. your life. Yeah, the same uh, producers that produced the movie Soul Surfer have uh, are producing a movie on my life. They're going to production in September. And uh, hopefully if uh, everything stays on schedule, it'll be out next year. And, you know, the, the people have been trying to make a movie on me for the last 20 years. And they always wanted to make another good fella, another casino. I don't want to do that. But this group, um, they're going to honor God in this movie. I've read the script. I'm thrilled with it. Amen. And, and I, I made a promise, you know, I've been so blessed. You know, I speak to thousands of people a month, and I make a promise and a commitment. If God does not, is not honored in that movie, it'll never hit the screen. Yeah. So Beautiful. now don't tell me how I'm, I'm going to take care of that if it don't happen, but uh, I'm going right, to make sure. Right. Well, you know, you think about a mob movie, and you, of course, you know, it's, it's all F-bombs and, and all sorts of bad language because we're just so used to it with, the, like, the right. Sopranos and Goodfellas and the rest of that. But uh, this is, they're going to have to take another approach. I mean, they just have to dig a little deeper for them in the writing, correct? Yeah, but you know, Carmen, if you look at The Godfather, there wasn't one cuss word in that movie. And when I say that, nobody remembers that. Yeah. But go look at it. Not one cuss word, and yet it was the greatest mob movie ever made. Right. So you can do it. You know, you can do right. it. He's right. He's absolutely right. <laughs> Who would I be in that movie? I, you? Uh, I got news for you. There's got to be a part for the two of you. Without a doubt. Come on, you for sure. Common for sure. What do you think? Oh, yes. yeah. Oh. yeah. I don't know. Who would I be? I'll be the, I'll be the younger-looking brother. Well, he's better looking than me, but you, you look more like a mob guy than me. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I was, was going to be in trouble, I'd walk down the street with you. They'd grab you first. Okay? <laughs> it's happened. I, I don't know. Who would I be? I don't know. I don't know. Would I be? Who, you, would you, be who, uh, who do you want to be? You, you'll be Michael. He you could think? be the younger version of my dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm serious. I'll play the hot dog guy. Oh, that, that's the guy that sells that's hot a... dogs. <laughs> the huh? guy selling the hot dogs? I'll, sell the, I'll be the hot dog guy in the corner. Hey, the hot dog vendors are very important in my life. You know that. They my make a lot of money, those hot dog guys, too. Yeah, yeah. On the way out the door, right. just hold it's on to this. <laughs> You're right. I know a millionaires that sell hot dogs. They work eight months a year. They go to Greece for the other four exactly. months. They're all Greek. <laughs> what do you say we all open a hot dog stand together? <laughs> Hey, I'm in. Sure. He's in. You all right? I'm in. You guys put up the money. I'll get a piece. There he goes. Oh. There he goes. <laughs> there he goes with the money. Oh, we got protection. <laughs> hey, don't touch my got, hot dogs. We, I don't like we got the muscle over here. <laughs> <laughs> we good. We got ready to go. We got a minute. Okay, um, Jamie Slocum's going to sing, and then I'm going to come back, and uh, I got a word uh, for those of you here tonight that, um, and those of you that are watching, that you got somebody in your family that might be, you know, a little bit like a, a, a Michael Francesi that might be out there. You don't know how to get to them. and uh, or, or like a Shelly Lubin, you don't know what to say to them. We're going to think of a way. Now, Jim Labriola, I don't know. I wouldn't know what to say to this I guy. would say I if, if anybody's say. out there like me, get help. <laughs> <laughs> Medication is not a bad thing. 
I say he's 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 right. Um, <laughs> but you didn't have to agree with me. I gotta agree with somebody. You know. <laughs> Jamie Slocum's gonna.